Good afternoon and welcome to Virtual Face to Face with President Bruce Gerald. I'm Alex Lukowski, Executive Director of Media Relations. Grief, the experts tell us, is not an emotion like sadness, but a process through which we come to terms with loss. Now, seen through that lens, in different ways and for different reasons, we are all grieving right now. now certainly the families and friends of the nearly 570,000 Americans who died in this pandemic are suffering the greatest loss. Many of them were unable even to provide comfort in sickness or to be present at the end of life. And afterward, the need for social distancing has prevented or at least impeded things like vigils for the dying and funerals that provide guidance and reassurance for survivors. Funerals held via Zoom, although strangely becoming more common, are a poor substitute. About 31 million more Americans contracted COVID and survived, but there too is loss. The CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report noted as early as last July that prolonged symptom duration and disability are common in adults hospitalized with severe coronavirus disease. Harvard Health says 50 to 80% of patients continue to have some bothersome symptoms three months after the onset of COVID-19. For a smaller group, the so-called long haulers, the symptoms may be serious, fatigue, body aches, shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating, headaches, and difficulty sleeping. And it's too early to tell when, if ever, it will end, leaving them in an emotional limbo, mourning the loss of their former lives. Another group particularly hard hit, as we all know, are healthcare workers. The founder of Grief.com put it this way, they're always second guessing themselves, wondering if they could do more. Nurses and doctors are seeing multiple deaths in a day and they're sitting with the anguish of the families. No one has been trained for this much death. A recent article in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management cautions that special attention must be paid to our healthcare worker trainees who may have not yet developed personal or professional grief management strategies and are coming into healthcare practice during a time of great disruption to both teaching and clinical care. And even if you're lucky enough to have never been directly impacted by COVID, we've all lost family gatherings, social networks, freedom to travel, financial security, even just a feeling of safety and confidence about the future. A writing in the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology, researchers from Rice University caution that the, the effects of grief, particularly long-term or what's called complicated grief, may be as physically damaging as any disease, instigating trouble sleeping, higher blood pressure, depression, even damaging inflammation. So what can we do? We have experienced loss and it's not over. How can we process that loss or at least reconcile it so we can move forward and live the best lives we can? And what can we do for our patients or colleagues and families? Well, joining Dr. Kirschling, I should say today, Dr. Gerald is, is not with us. Uh, School of Nursing Dean Jane Kirschling is, uh, is filling in as a, a host for Dr. Gerald today. Uh, she's got two panelists, Reverend Dr. Susan Carroll Roy is the Director of Pastoral Care Services at the University of Maryland Medical Center. She's provided care for patients, families, and healthcare workers for nearly 24 years. And from the School of Social Work, Associate Professor John Cagle, his work has focused on end of life, hospice, and palliative care issues. Welcome to you both. I, I wanna remind the audience that uh, this program is being recorded and will be posted on the UMB homepage, umaryland.edu. If you have a question, please look for the chat button at the bottom of your screen, select chat with host, and write your question there. When the time comes, we'll call on you by name, so please listen for that. And if you would rather remain anonymous, that's okay too, just let me know. Now here's our host today, Dr. Jane Kersling. Thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for joining us today. The president does send his regrets, and I will try hard to fill a big set of shoes, but I'm not quite sure I can totally fill them. I'm so pleased to have our two panelists with us, Dr. Roy and Dr. Cagle. So what I'd like to do is start with a question about why do we grieve and why do we want to be with others when we're grieving? Well, I can um, start uh, with an attempt to say a few words about that. Um, it would seem that we grieve because we love and um, loving makes us vulnerable uh, when there is loss and we um, tend to want to be with one another uh, to share um, at that moment, um, share what we're feeling, uh, have that heard, uh, brought into um, voice, 
and uh, to honor um, the situation, whether it's a person that has died or uh, whether there's been a different kind of loss. Yes, I agree. I think that grief is a very normal process. It's um, experienced almost ubiquitously uh, across cultures, although our uh, process of grieving uh, differs depend depending on our uh, cultural norms and orientation. Um, but yeah, when we have a, a strong attachment to uh, someone or we're accustomed to a, a certain um, routine or uh, activities in life and we lose uh, the individual or um, those facets of our daily living, um, we feel those losses uh, in a, an emotional way. And so it depends on how connected we are to what we lose and who we lose. popularized the idea of the stages of grief ranging from denial to acceptance. So what do you think about that model today and especially in light of the pandemic? Is it still uh, a model that can guide us? So I think you were muted for the first portion of your uh, question, but it sounds like you're asking about Kubler-Ross's stages mm -hmm. of grief model. Um, and uh, whether or not that is so relevant today. And I, I do think that uh, the, the stages of grief, uh, the shock and the depression and the, the guilt and the anger that people feel um, uh, when loss occurs, uh, that those are indeed still relevant today. And um, one thing that she talks about that really doesn't get a, a, a lot of uh, notoriety is this idea of hope. And she talks about different stages of approaching death and grief, but she talks about uh, hope and optimism mm -hmm. throughout all of these stages. And um, so I think that's kind of an underappreciated piece of, uh, of her work. And she's about these, uh, in many ways, she started a public conversation about um, Death, dying, and grief, and so she's um, quite the seminal figure in in the field. Dr. Roy, any additional thoughts? Sure. I I think uh, we've learned a little bit over the course of time uh, with Kubler Ross's uh, work, uh, even before we got to this pandemic that. Uh, the stages um, sometimes don't flow in a linear way. Um, sometimes they're cyclical, they, they're uh, back and forth. Um, uh, we, we thought we were done with the anger and all of a sudden it's back. Uh, and we thought we were at a different place and we find ourselves um, uh, re-experiencing those different um, stages. And um, I think the pandemic has um, maybe reshuffled them a little bit. Um, you know, when we think about uh, not being physically present with someone as they die, or not having the opportunity to see um, a loved one after death, um, that can make, um, I think that can impact um, acceptance and denial. It's like, well, it didn't really happen. I didn't see it. They're not, they're just not home right now that, you know, we're, you know, they're still at work there, you know, there's that kind of sense that there, there was something, some part of that process that was missed. Um, so I, I think that that is, um, that's been more evident perhaps in the pandemic. For me, go ahead, Dr. Cagle. 
I was just going to say that uh, for me, one of the models that I do appreciate and find um, quite helpful when thinking about grief is the stress and coping, model, uh, which um, frames our ability to deal with loss and death in a way that um, uh, that considers both our personal resources and our current state of mental health and our history of loss and um, uh, our various resources, uh, but also the stressors that we're facing. So we've we've got these strengths and things that contribute to our resiliency and the, the stressors and um, compound losses. And those two things kind of converge in order to um, uh, determine how we cope with adversity. And uh, one thing that is um, impacted is our ability to rely on our um, most helpful coping resources. And those are the, the people that we connect with and the activities that we engage in that are, are typically um, social in, um, in nature and uh, the rich tools we engage in after a lot we've had to figure out ways to do that um, while physically distancing so um, yeah I, I find that to be a, a helpful model and it's been particularly useful uh, within the COVID context. So as we think about those folks who potentially are in the audience today who weren't able to be with their loved one at the time of their death, what are two or three pieces of, pieces of advice you'd give to them? Well, I think um, this might have already been uh, suggested and that's gonna be um, to have a sense of what that means for them. So I, I remember um, working with a patient's wife very early in the pandemic, and it was during the time that uh, they uh, she could not um, be present. Uh, the patient was COVID positive, and um, we offered um, obviously Zoom and and those options for her to see and um i it's has stayed with me that she did not want to do that um she said um they had such a bond at, that they could she felt that she could communicate with her husband um in her own way and and really didn't want that. So part of it is just to uh, ask, you know, how is this for you? How how was it for you not being able to be present? What what did that mean for you? And to just kind of get a sense of of what that is. Um, and then I think um, depending upon what and and. Dr. Cagle has already mentioned our own personal histories that that play into these things. You know, what, how did that potentially complicate not being present or not being able to be present? Um, but then I think, um, you know, the another question would be, what do you want to do with that? Um, and um, you know, how do we as as individuals um, make peace with that? Um, and what what are um, what then is the importance of um, uh, of the image that we hold in our hearts and in our minds of that person, or um, that that um, are there uh, ways that we can help, or that that we can help others, or that we as individuals can. Um, find peace with that reality. Um, so those would be a few thoughts that I, I would have. 
Dr. Cagle, any other thoughts? Suggestions, and I sure I I think I would um, work to uh, normalize and validate the experience, and um, when it comes to being there for the people that we love at the very end of life, I think we have these um, expectations that we'll be, be right next to them. Uh, by their side, maybe holding their hand, but um, being there to comfort and support them. And so when those um, expectations are um, shattered by the reality of uh, COVID restrictions and um, physical distancing, even at the very end of life, I think it's um, especially upsetting. Not only is uh, the loss and the um, Healthcare crisis scary for the individual, um, but um, the fact that they can't be there um, with their loved one is especially difficult. And this has been a, a very common experience for uh, many people um, uh, who have loved ones in nursing homes or who were admitted to the ICU uh, and they couldn't be there. Uh, with their loved one uh, at the very end. And so I would certainly normalize that experience. And I, I would also encourage uh, just self-care, um, uh, trying to find the activities in life uh, that they find meaningful and rejuvenating and, and helpful. And, uh, you know, loss is difficult and coping with that is, is a struggle but they're also life affirming and um, avenues for growth, even when loss is present. So I wanna shift focus and talk about our healthcare workers who've been on the front line now for 13 months. And whether it's in nursing homes or in hospitals or in other settings. So they've, they've suffered the loss of many patients and also some loss of their own family contact and they've witnessed the grief of many others. So what should we be doing to help them get through their grief? Yeah, that's uh, such an excellent question, uh, Dean Kirschling, and um, it's something that's been very much um, uh, front and center for the medical center from the very beginning, is how can we best support uh, everyone who is uh, on the front lines, um, especially nursing and providers. Um, so um, there are a, a number of resources that were marshaled, um, you know, including um, leaders and um, uh, other uh, providers being present and just asking how people are doing. Um, there have been um, initiatives uh, with um, uh, debriefings and um, teas to um, gather, even if it's a, a virtual tea. We, we have a chaplain, uh, Rabbi Ruth, who leads these virtual teas. She did them in real time before, before we couldn't do that. But um, in some ways, we were uh, very fortunate that we had resources already established and could take those onto a, a virtual platform uh, to continue to support um, people. Um, I, th I think um, it's really um, encouraging um, all of us to um, recognize how uh, the the losses that we're experiencing in, in this pandemic, um, uh, what, how we want to relate to those, you know, what, what, what meaning will those have for us and for our careers, for the way in which we practice in the future, for um, uh, the way in which we um, embrace our calling uh, to healthcare. Um, so I, I think those um, maybe deeper meanings of 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 um, 
healthcare as a calling, as a as um, something that we respond to uh, that that um, has has a depth and breadth for us. And so, what? How does this impact our overall understanding of that work? Yeah, I think yeah. there are also some very different contexts um, when it comes to nursing home care, especially long term patients. The staff members may have known them for years and years, and in many ways, those individuals become like family. And um, so it's important to acknowledge those losses, um, allow those uh, staff members to to grieve and uh, to memorialize that person uh, and uh, to rely on their team members to support each other. Uh, I do think that just some basic education and um, acknowledging those losses can go a long way to, to being supportive. I also know that there are questions. I have many more questions, but I know that there are questions from the audience. So I'm going to see if Alex would uh, see if we have questions that want to come forward at this time. We do. We have some people with uh, things that they'd like to share. I want to bring in Jody Barr. Jody, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. I just wanted to um, ask the question of how do you deal with losing somebody during COVID and not being able to be there when they took their last breath? It's kind of been something hard for me to deal with since losing my father in November. And I struggle with that guilt because I'm kind of the one that made him go to the hospital. And um, from there, it just, you know, didn't get any better and he ended up, you know, losing his life. But I struggle with that daily um, and it, I just kind of try to block it out be, to not deal with the emotions and the guilt that comes with it. And I'm just wondering if maybe, you know, somebody could give me just anything to try to help me to move forward from this. Well, first of all, thank you so very much for for sharing uh, that experience and. Um, being vulnerable and sharing your pain with us and with uh, the group because um, your uh, being willing to share that allows other people who are uh, might be feeling a similar um, uh, similar feelings uh, to to find some um, um, community uh, in in that journey. Um, What would what would you like to do? Um, just start the healing process. Um, I also lost my mother six years ago, so um, they passed six years ago uh, apart in a month. So it's like during the holiday time, my birthday. So I, you know, just want to be able to just move forward. I know grief has no time limit, um, but it's just really hard for me to even look at pictures, to talk about him without, you know, pretty much breaking down. And what would that be like just to break down? Um, uh, just mainly cry and just shut out the world as you know have I that I have been doing here lately, just staying secluded and to myself and not really trying to do anything, you know, outside of, you know, going to work. I'd rather just go home and stay there. So I'm going to um, just make an observation that on um, the I don't know that there's, um, well, I suppose people could try to give you an answer, um, but 
I suspect that you will live into your answer. Right. And I would just affirm that there are times uh, that um, what you're doing right now may be part of what you need to do and that that's okay. And okay. there is, um, grief makes us very vulnerable. And sometimes we, uh, it was, wasn't it Langston Hughes who had the poem about um, keeping ourselves from the too rough, uh, uh, too rough world? Um, you know, sometimes we just need to protect ourselves um, so that we can do the part of grieving that we need to do. Uh, right. I, 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 and, and you will know when you're able to venture out of that cocoon. Um, and it may be um, in gradual steps. Um, and you may go back for a little bit. Um, but um, I would just affirm that it sounds as though you have a sense of what you need um, and are taking care of that. And in due time, that will potentially give you some strength to move to the next the next place that you need to move. And Dr. Cagle, um, maybe you have some other suggestions. Sure, right. From what I'm hearing, it, it sounds like you're using some very uh, common coping techniques of compartmentalization and and so you kind of set it aside and and deal with it in um, contained spaces. And it also sounds like you have concerns that maybe you're feeling um, stuck and like this could be a, a problem if it continues. And it might be. Um, it depends on whether or not it's a problem for you and whether you don't see any progress in terms of your ability to cope or engage with others. If you're avoiding um, uh, social activities and uh, connecting with friends and families and you're unable to do the things that you love, um, if that continues um, uh, in a, a long-term way, um, and it, you don't see things getting better, then perhaps uh, reaching out for some for, uh, help from a professional grief counselor, for example, um, or a, a doctor to um, get some more support and advice. Uh, what I'm hearing right now doesn't necessarily sound problematic or pathological. It just sounds um, like you're struggling with these uh, compound losses. And um, so I encourage you to do what you need to take care of yourself and continue to monitor um, whether or not you're making progress and able to do the things that you want to do and engage in the way that you want to engage. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you and good luck to you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And Alex, do we have another question? We do. Uh, let me bring in uh, Shanette Taylor Hawkins. She's had a very difficult time. Shanette, would you like to share with the uh, the panel and the audience? Go ahead, Jeanette. I think you muted. I just want to say thank you to all the professionals out there that's listening and enduring a lot of our pain, because that's exactly what it is, a lot of pain. Um, this time in 2019, there's no way I will be talking to any anybody. I, I can do this. I found myself feeling like, okay, I need to talk to somebody. And you guys were there, and I thank you. Um, Jody told me about this meeting, so thank you, Jody, for the meeting. Um, I am in multiple grief counseling. It is a elevator. It's up and down. And if I did not have a outlet like you all are providing, um, mentally, I would have cracked by now. It's just like, you know what? Like, 
But I just want to say thank you. Um, please let any and everybody know that it is help available and don't be afraid to talk. Um, don't hold that stuff in. Failure is not an option. We got to keep pressing forward. We did. So thank you guys. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that and for expressing your gratitude. That's another thing that has um, been suggested as a helpful practice during this pandemic is to reach out and thank people or to, to consider those things that we can be grateful or uh, thankful for in the midst of, of very difficult, challenging moments. We, we have you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't know if the, the Jody that was being referenced is Dr. Jody Fry from the School of Social Work, but she um, it does research on uh, employee, the employee assistance, a useful resource if someone is feeling like they are stuck or struggling with grief. Um, or other emotional problems and um, needs some assistance. So I think that could be a good resource. I just wanted to pass along. We, we have an audience member who writes anonymously. What's the best way to address someone after loss? You know, so it, you know that someone you work with or someone you, you know has experienced great loss. Do you say, I'm sorry for your loss? Uh, that's what, what, what comes to mind, but is there something else from your perspective that can be better to be helpful to the person who has experienced the loss? I don't think there's any perfect formula for the best uh, way to support someone or the right words to say, you know, different people need different things. Um, and so it depends. Um, I would say that um, quite often people will say, let me know what you need. And um, sometimes it's a little better to be proactive and suggest some ways that you could help. So. You know, I could uh, maybe make some meals or I could come by and give you some company and that way you're um, uh, being a little more active in what you are offering as opposed to letting the individual figure out um, what you can provide and how that fits with what they need. Um, uh, but I don't have uh, the, the miracle phrase for exactly the right words to say. Um, I do think that people have a tendency to want to um, minimize the pain of grief or reduce it, assuage it in some way. And for many people, it's important to feel that pain. And so that might be something to be aware of is that um, the pain um, can be a, a useful, meaningful process for the people that are experiencing it. Yeah. I, I certainly uh, echo uh, those sentiments, Dr. Cable. I, I'm really curious with the pandemic uh, that has changed so many ways in which we do so many things on how we will um, look back on this at some point and understand its impact on our grieving and on um, you know, we've been very accustomed to um, uh, um, having that funeral within the first day, depending upon our religious tradition, or three days. Um, and one of the things that we often hear, at least as chaplains or pastors, is uh, from people who are grieving, um, we used to hear, you know, um, everybody came for the funeral and everybody left. And now I'm all by myself. Um, so it's kind of interesting now. Um, everybody might not come for that memorial service until three months from now or six months from now. 
And so what do we do with this kind of time in between? And um, that reaching out to people, um, the phone actually still works just fine. And just picking it up and calling and saying, I heard this happened. And again, this has to do with, as Dr. Cagle's already said, what your relationship is with somebody and you know the context, but certainly um, reaching out in some way and saying, I heard um, just, just reaching out to check and let you know I'm thinking about you. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of take things from there. But um, uh, I think one of the things we have heard uh, just over the course of, of grief in general is that there's a, a rush to be present and then there's a vacuum where um, life, life goes on. Um, so I, I think maybe the pandemic in some ways has slowed us down a tad and maybe in that that space we can find ways to take a moment to reach out a little bit more Right, if you're looking for another question, mm -hmm. Kate Tafelski uh, is asking a question I think a lot of us are asking. We, you know, we, we, we learn to deal with our own grief and, and things at home, but when we go back to work, uh, how, will we, how will we do that? Kate, what, ask, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you said it pretty well. Just do you have any suggestions on how we manage our grief returning to the office? You know, working from home has provided such flexibility and comfort, and I've been so lucky to have such great supervisors and coworkers. But it'll be a change of scenery, a change of routine, and we're just all such different people. So much has happened in the last year and however many months it'll be by that point that, um, you know, things aren't things aren't the same as when we left them. Okay, can I just ask you, are, are you experiencing grief for a, a lost someone someone you've lost or are you experiencing sort of a, a potential loss of your lifestyle and the way things you become accustomed to what are you, right. what are you personal grief um okay. actually the friday before we left i got a call that i had to go home because my sister was sick so mm -hmm. i left when i left the office to go for you know the foreseeable future for the pandemic was under very different circumstances than i would have ever ima imagined so going back into the office will be very different. Um, and, and I know I'm not alone in that, so that's what I wanted to ask. So I do think that routine and predictability can be comforting in times of grief. And, you know, we've, uh, many of us have become accustomed to um, working from home. And so we have our uh, rituals at home and our routines and we're comfortable in our personal spaces. And so returning to work may indeed be a disruption and uh, a little bit of a, a challenge for those that are, are coping. And um, so I, I don't necessarily have um, some advice uh, except for to say maybe establish uh, some new uh, routines and um, habits that you find um, helpful when you do return to the office. Yeah, and I, the other thing I would suggest, having been back into the School of Nursing a couple of times now, is try to envision going back. And by what I mean by that is we left in March and we will be going back in, but the we left and everything will still be the way it was in March of 2020. So if you have a calendar on the wall, it will be an immediate reminder of how long this has been. I was there the other day and went through the Southern Management door between the School of Nursing and Southern Management. And there's a sign that's hanging there that says, Southern Management is closed as of March. And it just struck me about, wow, we've made it through two Marches now. So. I think if you can start to think about um, what, how the space was when you left, and then as Dr. Cagle has suggested, maybe you introduce something new into that environment in terms of 
something that's a meaningful you that you've had on your workspace at home that you never would have thought to take to work before so that you can try to normalize between the two environments. And I know my first couple of times back into the building, there was a sense of anxiety and uncertainty and just sort of disorientation because it's like, wow, all this stuff that I thought was a part of my work world, it, it, I left it behind. And now I have to figure out how to reenter. You know, it's funny, a colleague of mine left, was very kind, left a calendar, a new calendar under my door. So when mm -hmm. I did come periodically, I have to go into the office. When I came back, number one, it felt like it was nice that my colleague was taking care of me. And you're right, mm -hmm. that point about it replaced the old 2020 calendar and it made me feel like this is a new a new time and we can come back and it was it was a wonderful gesture mm -hmm. we have an anonymous question regarding um people uh managing well i'll just i'll just read it the the uh the uh, member of our audience writes i have a question regarding how staff and providers can manage their own anxiety around working with patients who are non-compliant with their health thereby putting themselves and children at greater risk of complications or death even due to the pandemic. It almost seems like the fear of potentially losing a patient and having to grieve. How does one cope with that as a healthcare provider? You have people who are non-compliant and you, you fear that they're gonna to come to harm or others and there's not much you can do. So it sounds to me like the struggle is that health providers often equip themselves with skills and tools and interventions that can um, have beneficial outcomes and improve people's lives. But if somebody is um, uh, not sticking with a treatment regimen or uh, uh, engaging in risky health behaviors, then it's difficult to uh, contribute to those positive outcomes, and that can feel very um, uh, frustrating for providers. And I strongly believe, uh, as difficult as this is, and I believe in a patient-centered approach to care, and so I feel like it's my job to educate and empower patients um, so that they know um, what their options are, uh, they're aware of the risks and benefits, that we're giving them all the resources they need to um, act um, so that they can um, care for themselves. But at the end of the day, they're the ones making the, the decisions for themselves about what is the best course of action. And um, so as frustrating as that might be, I, I really believe that that's an important value is that we allow people to make what we think are bad decisions because that really is what empowerment is about is that we equip them but we don't really tell them what to do or uh, make decisions for them so alex well, do you have another question or dr roy i was just going to echo that was well well put, Dr. Cable. The um, only other thing I could think of potentially adding would be um, just a question, uh, depending upon the circumstance of, of you know, it, kind of understanding why they're sort of um, making the decisions they are, um, just on the off chance that you know, there's just um, to your point of education and resources, um, something that somebody hasn't missed in terms of offering, um, you know, a, a suggestion or another resource. But um, other than that, um, I really appreciated your the way in which you answered that. All right, I want to I want to bring in Carla Gardner, who 
has been working as a grief counselor and has had a tremendous uh, burden to to work with. Uh, Carla, do you uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Carla. Well, well I'll, I'll read what she's written. She says, prior to the pandemic, I used to conduct group grief counseling for my patients have lost 12 family members. My mother uh, and my manager and a coworker, I have a hard time unburdening myself to a therapist due to concern that they themselves are experiencing grief. And I'm struggling at work to try to keep my same level of performance. The guilt is too much. I cannot be at 100% for others as I used to be. That's a difficult spot to be in. What, what, can she, what, what would you advise for her? Well, um, <clears throat> I might suggest that we all cut ourselves just a bit of grace and that we cut each other some grace. Um, we've all lived through extraordinary circumstances and um, if we're honest with ourselves, may not have been at a hundred percent every single moment uh, since uh, I think it was 404 days uh, today that they said we had our first COVID positive patient admitted to the downtown campus. Um, and I'm not, that's not, um, I don't say that as um, um, a, a, a reason not to do our best. I'm just suggesting that um, part of what we may need is uh, to give ourselves and each other a little bit of breathing room in this and knowing that um, our intent is to do the best and to be the best and to be as fully present as we possibly can be and that we're doing our own self-care and self-work to achieve that uh, and also appreciate some grace. Yeah, I I agree and I I can see having experienced your own losses um, as a, a a possible strength and a, a way that you could um, perhaps better empathize with the the people that you work with and connect with them uh, and relate to them, but. Um, if your own loss history and your own grief is impeding your ability to provide them support, then maybe it is time to um, take a break and do that self care and allow for that um, personal grace uh, that um, uh, Susan is, has suggested. All right. Well, one of our colleagues from the graduate school, Michelle Pierce, has asked me to read this. She, she says, you mentioned briefly the idea that although none of us uh, want to go through loss, sometimes good things can come out of this difficult situation. In psychology, we call this post-traumatic post growth. She said, I thought it might be helpful if you could share a little more about this important concept with the audience. I think it can give us hope when we're in the middle of loss. I personally think that um, the resilience that we gain by um, moving through loss and experiencing it and um, not necessarily getting over it, but uh, surviving it and being able to re-engage and reconnect with others is um, an incredible resource. And there are um, many things that we can learn about ourselves, um, about our others, about how we love and about how we cope um, that contribute to um, uh, our personal skill set and strengths and uh, opportunity to move forward in the future.
Okay, an anonymous uh, uh, questioner is asking about the difference, if there is a difference between uh, mourning and grieving. And sometimes we talk about that. People say I'm grieving and they, they really mean they feel sad. I mean, can you sort that out? What, what is it that we're talking about? We talk about grieving or mourning or sadness. Uh, so, I, I think uh, mourning um, has connections to uh, uh, depression and melancholia and kind of the psychodynamic legacy that uh, Freud gave us. Um, he composed his seminal work called Mourning and Melancholia and talked a lot about um, loss and and things that we would um, consider grief um, these days. And so I think it has that connection to the um, uh, psychodynamic legacy of Freud. And we've um, it, not completely, but in some ways moved away from that. Um, uh, I'm, that's my take on it. I'm someone else might have a, another opinion about that. The only uh, thing that comes to my mind is um, that from um, a religious perspective, um, I think sometimes there are traditions that have uh, or refer to a set period of time for mourning, um, which may um, carry a different um, um, the expectation of what a person is doing during that time or how we're, um, uh, how others would relate to a person during that time, um, which feels different from grieving. Um, so that would be my only uh, addition to what Dr. Cagle has suggested. We have one more question here. Uh, let's bring in Mary Phelan. That's someone you know, Dr. Kirschling. Mary, uh, what's your question? Hi, thank you, Alex. Um, to the panel, can you speak about the loss in general that we are experiencing, um, not because of a personal death, but our way of life has changed? and is going to continue to change in many different ways as we inch forward to returning to campus and just moving about the planet in general. Um, there was a similar feeling after September 11th um, with things being different and having to adjust to a new way of life. And some people have an easier time doing that than others. And um, there's a lot of different feelings associated with all of that. So I just wondered if you might speak to that kind of grief when um, it's not a tangible person, but still very much real um, in the eyes of those who are feeling it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have um, in many ways lost our sense of uh, normalcy and maybe we've reestablished some um, habits in some way that are uh, allowing us to create a new normal instead of return to the old normal. Um, but I, I do think that like 9-11, the pandemic uh, will change us um, in a, a an indelible way. It, it has left an impression on um, our collective psyche, and so I, I'm not sure that truly returning to normal um, is possible. And so it will be um, uh, adjusting to the new normal and trying to deal with our anxiety. I just saw that um, Israel is um, no longer requiring people to wear masks in 
pub masks in public and that type of change may be anxiety provoking for people if they see uh, maskless uh, individuals out in public because we have been so trained over the past uh, 14 months or so that um, that's how we stay safe. And um, so I think it, it's gonna be a struggle for uh, us collectively to um, establish that new normal and deal with this changed reality. And I would just add to that, and we've already talked a little bit about this um, in the midst of the difficulty of uh, developing that new normal for ourselves as individuals or communities or uh, nation or world uh, to also uh, keep in focus that which we perhaps um, value in a different way um, as a result of what we've been through individually or collectively. Um, and and um, incorporating that in, into our new norm. Um, so whether it's um, being able to be with people in a different way at some point, um, will we how will we savor that? Um, or if it's doing some type of hybrid uh, with work and um, maintaining some ability to um, do that remotely, um, you know, how, how will we also uh, mourn, mourn the loss and, and also um, embrace what might be meaningful and significant hope um, or a way of living that is more humane to ourselves and each other in this planet as we celebrate Earth Day. So I want to thank both of our panelists and Alex for this conversation. I want to thank everyone who came forward and presented with vulnerability in terms of the experiences that you're having. And I would go back to what Dr. Roy said in terms of we need to cut ourselves a little slack and we need to cut each other a little slack as we try to figure out what the new normal will be. Um, we all wish you the very best on the journey. And I um, thank you for being here today. Please stay safe, stay well, and I hope to see you in person sometime in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.